Good morning. Why don't you uh, want to stand up for a second? Stretch. Take a deep breath. You ready to get in the game? <laughs> game of work. What I'd hope to accomplish here, we'll have to sit down and we'll get started in the next few minutes, is to inspire your personal leadership. That is the leadership that we all have within us to go ahead and apply your own self-determination and your will to win in your game. I want to share with you some of the exposures or experiences that I've had over the years and some ideas that I think can add value. Uh, I asked Jeffrey, usually at the end of these presentations, we ask the speaker to give a testimony of uh, how they came to find Christ and how their Christian life is benefited them over the years. I asked Jeffrey if I could start with that. Uh, fundamentally because I consider mine simple. I was very fortunate. I was born into a Catholic family. I was baptized as a child and then I went to Catholic grade school taught by nuns and so I've been embraced in my Christianity since the very beginning. And as uh, uh, people that had that benefit, uh, grew up as a kid paper boy, Cub Scouts, did all of the normal things, went on to become an engineer, uh, graduate from Michigan Tech, and I've had a very lucky life, if you may, a very fortunate life. And uh, I've been on track most of the time, been off track some, ups and downs. Uh, I consider my greatest blessing was when I heard recently that only 15% of the Catholics are still practicing their faith. The tragedy of that, it's not only Catholics, it's our secularization of society and what's happened around our world to the fact that people of faith have unfortunately stopped engaging and stopped practicing. So one of the great missions of CBRT and a testimony and why I was attracted to it, it was a forum, it was a place where actually people of faith could speak out and say, you know, let's do the right thing and let's bring back what it takes. And what I found is more and more people, and as Jeffrey mentioned, I chair the local chapter here, and as people come to the meetings, they feel a refreshed opportunity to lead themselves and lead others in their companies to speak the truth and step forward and engage their life at a level they've never been before. And there's extraordinary power in doing that. So, first of all, let, where did I get play to the end? Right after the Super Bowl, Tom Brady was interviewed and they say, how did you ever do that? He went from third quarter, they were a couple uh, minutes left, and everybody had given up hope on the New England Patriots defeating Atlanta. And Atlanta certainly looked very, very strong. And they interviewed Brady, they said, well, what was it? What, what did you do? And he said, well, we just played our game plan. We just kept going. He said, I know, but you were defeated. You were going to live or lose all the way to the end. He says, that's why we play to the end. That struck me. And I think how often in my own life and in other lives and in other businesses that I've seen do people stop before they play to the end. They could have had victory if they would have played to the end. They could have doubled their energy. They could have brought their team together. They could have done the kind of leadership that Tom Brady did in playing to the end. So I embraced that idea and I started thinking about it and that's how I gathered, garnered the comments today. Tom Brady was truly a leader. There are some extraordinary players on that team. They're all leaders in their own right. But they had one premier leader and that was Tom Brady. So I took those ideas and I said, well, what is it about that leadership that we would want to embrace ourselves? And I came up with this acronym, AIM. I said, you know, we really need to be accountable. We have to expect accountability from ourselves and from others that we work with. Second of all, we should lead with integrity. And third, we need to embrace mobility, flexibility. So let's take a look at each of those. In accountability, there is a phrase that is used by Bill Belichick in the coaching team, and in fact there's videos out on YouTube called Do Your Job Part One, Do Your Job Part Two. 
And it's an analysis of what the coaches do in getting the team prepared. And the theme in the New England Patriots is do your job. Know your job and do your job. So accountability says know what you are expected to do, do what you're expected to do, and measure what you're expected to do. Because without that, how do you know you performed and delivered the results? Because accountability is really what the connection is between commitment, I say I'm going to do it, and the results. If I never have to have a report card, if I never have to examine whether or not I accomplish something, how do I know that I'm accountable? The second one is integrity. And I picked this up, I think, in a sermon or something here just recently, and it said, what is integrity? Integrity is living your inside on the outside. And how too often we might be believing something or thinking something in the inside, and then we present ourselves in a different fashion. Well, it's very difficult to lead in that way because you have divided thought, divided interest. So whatever is on your inside is more transparent than you really understand. And if, in fact, you have a consistent set of purposes, you have a belief, you have values, you know what you believe, and you can stand proud and tall about it, it is easier to lead. Anything short of that is a fraud. People can see the misrepresentation. They may not tell you, but they can see it. He doesn't walk the talk. So it's so much easier to get a sense of purpose, get a sense of your faith and your belief, and then live your inside on the outside. People will follow. Mobility is the next one. And when I talk mobility, I'm talking about the ability to change and adapt. I am always frustrated when I work with a company or I work in a community group, and it seems like you're pulling teeth to get them to accept reality. I like to say to people, the internet is here to stay. <laughs> Cell phones are going to be with us forever. I came out of college at a time when I'm an electrical engineer. There were no digital computers. I worked on some of the earliest digital computers. We have gone through multiple generations of that. Can you imagine what's going to happen in the next 50 years? The Internet of Things is about ready to take over, where there will be a beacon and a camera and a site and an interconnection to every human being and every automatic automation that you can imagine. It's going to come. It's reality. And in fact, if you don't embrace reality and think mobility is all about autonomous cars, self-driving cars, no, mobility is about the cell phone. Mobility is about virtual reality. It's about being able to stand here and be present in Paris. It is about technology that we just can't accept. And it's remarkable to me how many people are leading and managing as if this was 1980. And then they complain about the new generation and this. They have no idea. The world is moving on whether they want to be part of that leadership or not. It's up to them to get engaged. Learning to the end. One of the things that I picked up in my research on the Tom Brady is he had been to 111 practices. Think about that. They only play 16 games in a season. So he practiced six times more than they played the game. And then they had another 11 games that are the whole series of postseason. The reality is that we're going to work for about 50 years, 2,000 hours a year working for about 100,000 hours. And in fact, the education that most of us have received if we went through college is about 20,000 hours of education. So we only invested 20,000 hours of education and we're going to perform for 100,000 hours in the marketplace, one-fifth of the time. The New England Patriots practice six times as many hours as they play. So we're in a deficit by a factor of 30, if you do the math. Interestingly enough, every year we talk about 
training in our companies. We talk about education or improving our own skill set. It is very rare for people to spend as many as even 40 hours a year learning something new. When I get out of college, I'm an engineer. Within four years of my graduation, most of what I learned technology was obsolete. And I hate to tell you how many more years ago that was. So I've been obsolete over and over and over again from a technology standpoint. So only if I put in 40 hours a year. If you just came to the CBRT monthly breakfast for two hours a week times 12 months, that would be 24 hours of improvement. And as you heard Amy Whipple say, you can come to that monthly breakfast and take away more ideas in two hours <laughs> at no charge <laughs> than any of the other development. So I look at it at minimum, we should be working in a networking. We should be engaging with other people to learn like Tom Brady did over and over and over in practice. Why does a golfer able to perform when he comes to Sunday? A golfer is able to perform because he or she has practiced, practiced, practiced. And their muscle memory is such that it's just a matter of the results to follow. A friend of mine, Chuck Coonrot, wrote The Game of Work in 1984. Chuck owns a franchise of the same company and I do, Leadership Management Incorporated. And I, in fact, Chuck was two years ahead of me. When I bought my franchise, I asked him to come up to Detroit and speak. And he spoke at the Somerset Inn. We did an all-day workshop. And he formulated the ideas for the book, which he subsequently wrote, called The Game of Work. That was in 1983. And Chuck released the book in 1984. Chuck identified the concept. He was a Michigan State guy. And he had graduated, played a little football in that era of, of the uh, 70s, 80s. I forget exactly who all of the, the uh, luminaries were at that time. But he said, in recreation, there's something different. People are engaged in a game, and they are competitive. They have spirit. They want to become better. And they're willing to go out and play for golf, pay for golf, or go pay for a football game, or go buy a tennis racket, or buy skis. They're willing to invest in their recreation, where they go to work and they ask to get paid. Boy, what a dramatic difference. Why would people go and put all that energy into recreation and pay for the privilege, when they go to work, who they're getting paid, and act like they shouldn't be engaged in whatever. And it's all because the heart of our human being is we're instinctly competitive. We instinctly want to get better. We instinctly want to compete and improve ourselves. What it comes down to is what's the score? How many times have you gone to a sporting event and it's all about what's the score? That's why they have the big scoreboard out there. If you went to a basketball game and they decided this game, we're not going to keep score. How many people do you think would leave the stadium? Most. Because the score is what's it all, what it's all about. These are testimonials from Chuck's book. The scorecards were great breakthroughs. When people began to scorekeep themselves, they began to instill that competitive spirit and to seek to get better and better. They're visual. They're owned by that individual person. It's not about the company. It's about the individual person competing against his best. Employees are taking personal responsibility for their own behavior. They become like golfers. They measure themselves against the scorecard. If you ever watch golf, you will see, sure, there's competitiveness at the very end. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to take the tournament. But the golfers are competing against their best. They're not competing against the other golfer. And that's what gets turned when you're keeping score. Accountability. See, you can only be held accountable to a plan that you have. Unfortunately, management is the most guilty party in this problem. They are rarely able to communicate or rarely clearly communicate what the goals are, what the disciplines are for not achieving the goals, what the outcomes can be, the hope, the possibility, the dream, 
and what it could mean to that individual person. And they don't inspect what they expect. They say they want something, but they never come back to check the score. And when you don't come back to check the score, we are all human. We will hide from the score. We will hide from our own accountability. And we must get the scoreboard up on the screen, and we must be able to look at it and daily track it and see what our performance is. Because behavior <clears throat> is really what it's all about. It's the activities you choose to do on a daily basis that deliver the results. There really are no surprises. It's if you fail to make sales calls every day, you will not get sales results. <laughs> if you make 10 sales calls a day, you will get so much results. If you make 20, you'll get more. And when it comes to achieving activity, we like to say to people, you have a budget or you have a goal. Here's another illustration. How about letting people work to their own potential? Let me tell you this story. I had a client years ago. We were doing a management training group <clears throat> and the accounts payable person said, well, I can't measure my performance. I said, why not? And she said, well, I'm accounts payable. And I just, when we buy things, I take the invoices that get sent to us and we process them and that's my job. I said, well, how many do you do every day? I don't know. I said, well, between now and next week, why don't you write down every day how many invoices you processed? She comes back to class the next week and she says, well, on Monday I did seven, and on Tuesday I did nine, on Wednesday I did four, and on Thursday I did 13, and on Friday I did 27. I says, wow, what happened on Friday? Why did you do 27? She says, well, it was the weekend and I had to get it done. <laughs> See, the game was going to be over in her mind and somehow she was able to perform at a level of 27. So I said, well, here's an idea. What would happen if you could get 27 done every day? Oh, that would be wonderful. I says, okay, so starting next week, why don't you, you can do 27. Yeah, I did that. I said, you do 27 on Monday, 27 on Tuesday, and there won't be any left. And then you can go do another job on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Because clearly your company invoices are not going to change the number coming in on average per week. But you'll get your whole job done in two days, having three days to do something else. My very simple increase in productivity because her potential was 27. Her potential wasn't four. She performed at the level she needed to be when she needed to get home for the weekend, all right? If you told Tom Brady, don't worry about it, you've got a budget. Your budget is to win the game. What score does he need? <laughs> How would you know? <laughs> you don't. You only know what the potential is. Tom Brady showed in one quarter of football, he had untapped potential. He could go from a major deficit to winning the game. You might have a Tom Brady in your company. You might be a Tom Brady. When was the last time you measured yourself against your potential rather than just your budget? Results, using results as the guide, people say, well, what was the profit at this month? What were the results for the month? Well, it's way too late. That's like driving the car over here, looking in the rear view mirror. You'd certainly hit something because you're watching what happened yesterday. In terms of results, you have to be forward thinking. You have to be measuring the activity in advance, correcting any error. If you only did four invoices in this lady's illustration and your potential is 27, you've got 23 to go before you go home that day because you've already demonstrated that potential. Activity tracking and corrective actions is essential every day. Consistent performance will deliver the results you want. And then there's the issue of mastery. It is remarkable to me how we, as individual people and leaders and owners of companies, can always expect better performance from the people that work for us. 
and we say, she could do better. He should do better. He can show up and do a lot more than he's doing. But we don't examine ourselves first. Because it's the old adage of watch what I do, not what I say. If, in fact, you develop a mastery yourself and become a demonstrator of seeking your own untapped potential, you become then a beacon for others. Other people want to compete and they want to aspire to what they see as results, not to what they hear. So the mastery of your own self-purpose, understanding who you are, where you want to go, what's your principal purpose in life, and openly disclosing it to others. People pretty soon know clearly where you are and where you want to take yourself and others that are surrounding you and impacting you. Nothing will change until the leader changes the game. Tom Brady, again, is a perfect example of that. What a remarkable journey from being 20-some points behind to winning the game just by staying on purpose and staying on game. Now let's talk about story. You hear movies, you hear about Hollywood. Hollywood has embraced a reality. 70% of what people do and get engaged in is driven by the story they hear. Stories have been around since the beginning of time. Our behaviors are created by the stories we learned. Our limitations are placed by the stories we carry in our head, the expectations. It's amazing how many people stop short of playing to the end because they don't believe they can win. And why should I continue to pursue if I can't win? So what I want to encourage everybody here is sit down quietly by yourself and determine what is your personal story? And then what is your business story? And then tell that personal story to yourself over and over and over again. And if you don't like the story, change it. Make it different than it is. You have the power to do that. Do the same thing for your company. What's the mission? What's the vision? What's the purpose? Create the story and tell the story over and over and over again. Isn't it interesting, the New England Patriots have been winning for 20 or some years, but they've had different players. <laughs> well, they have a story. They have a story that believes in themselves, that is a purpose, that is know your job, do your job, over and over and over again. And that is ever so evident in those videos that you'll see, those NFL videos about Belichick and the team. You will see the formation that they're going through. Well, we can do that with our companies. Once you've created the perfect story and you communicate it to engage employees, they will become part of your story or they will leave. Somebody often said, what happens when you don't train an employee? And they, or you train an employee and invest in them and they leave your company? And that isn't the right question. The question is, what if you don't train that person and they stay in your company? You can't afford a weak player on the team. Know your story, tell your story. Motivation, carrot in the stick, you've heard it for years. What works? Does the carrot work? More incentives, more motivation, or does the stick work? The reality is both work. But what works better is people understanding their personal goals, engaging every employee and engaging yourself. And really, what do you want out of life? That's that sense of purpose. What does the company's mission and purpose and what job goals? What do I have to do in my job in order to achieve that? Personal leadership is really the call that I made at the very beginning, and I want to close with that. Personal leadership is your knowledge, your energy, your time, your imagination, your communication skills, and your decision-making ability. How are you applying that? What is your untapped potential? Take those six and rate yourself. I'm a number three here. I'm about a four on my energy. I'm about a six on my time. And then what's your potential? Gee, my energy could be a nine. Gee, my communication skills could be a 10. And then that's your gap. 
Start with that gap analysis for yourself individually. And as you set your own new vision for yourself and then for your company, you will be shocked at how you can roll that simple script in a dialogue with friends, family, employees about what's your potential in knowledge, energy, time, imagination, communication, and decision-making capability. See, leadership requires followership. Everyone wants to follow a winner. Tom Brady was a winner. But only after the team wins the game does the coach recognize as having pulled that all together. And for most people in our lives, you're the coach. You're the one leading your family. You're the one leading your business. You're the one leading yourselves. And you've got to apply it, play to the end of the game before you're going to get the recognition. Yep, your business and your life is your story. You want to tell it, you want to live it, inspect it. Must accept personal responsibility for your own aim, for your own accountability, your own integrity, your own mobility, and for your personal leadership. If you do that, don't worry, you'll follow. There's a lot of story out there. The new companies are telling their story, the Googles, the Amazons, and they're telling a new story, completely different from what we may have learned. You have to tell your story. And I'll close with this. Authentic leadership is really doing the work to develop yourself. You are truly a leader if you'll self-examine, self-reflect, and execute your own plan. Second of all, have a moral compass that's driven on your beliefs and values. Understand what you believe in. Understand what's truthful. Understand what you value and don't waver. Hold strong to that. If you do that, others will follow. And then work on the problems that matter most to you. We are all distracted. There is so much chaos, so much noise, so much cell phone interaction, so much. You must take time to sit by yourself and decide what matters most to you. Because if you don't understand what matters most to you, how can you lead other people? How can you raise the expectations of friends and family and business? Because you don't even know what's important to you. For my life, having a great Christian foundation, following my faith, being able to use it, and then sell it, promote it to other people, brings me great joy and great value. And it allows me to use my skills and my talent and my energy in what I believe is a productive way for me and for others. So what I want to encourage each of you to do is your best days are yet to come. The, you're only in the third quarter. There's two minutes left in the third quarter, and there's a whole full quarter ahead. You must step out and play to the end. Play to the end in your own life and in your own game of work. Thank you. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him 
shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.